Welcome to the Star Spot. You're listening to Episode 1 for Friday, March 16th, 2012. your host at the Star Spot. The Star Spot is a space-themed podcast that will focus on all aspects of astronomy and space exploration. Episodes will feature interviews with guests of wide-ranging backgrounds, scientists, engineers, educators, artists, politicians, and business people. Topics will be similarly broad, from the latest space mission to how the universe began, from why humans explore to how we can make exploration economical. We'll also include a segment called Current in Space, bringing you reports on news and developments that may interest the space enthusiast. I'm joined today by David Lafreniere. Dr. Lafreniere is an astrophysicist and an assistant professor in the Department of Physics at the University of Montreal. His pioneering work relates to the detection of exoplanets, which are planets beyond our solar system, for which he's won multiple awards. His work has been published in Time Magazine, the National Geographic, ABC News, and many other publications. Thank you so much, Dr. Lafreniere, for joining us on the first episode of The Star Spot. It's my pleasure. Before we get into the the actual uh, details of the work itself, I'm curious what got you motivated to enter this very fascinating and uh, really quite new and to some extent risky area of research. The very first thing that got me thinking about uh, Chasing Exoplanets was actually a, a documentary that I saw in 1995 uh, about the very first uh, exoplanet that was discovered uh, by a team of Swiss uh, astrophysicists. So I was, um, I was in high school at the time, uh, finishing high school, and I saw this and I, I found it uh, amazing that we were able to see planets uh, around stars so far away. So, so that's really what got me excited. Uh, and uh, since then, well, from that point on, I sort of always kept in the back of my mind the idea of, of getting into that line of research. And so when I got to university and uh, I pursued the physics classes and I jumped on the opportunity to um, to keep on going in, in astrophysics and, and I, I mean, it worked. Uh, I was able to uh, to do what I what I thought about uh, from for many years. Within the broad area of uh, extrasolar planet detection and research, are there specific areas that that really pique your interest that you're hoping to uh, to look into? In the long term, um, pretty much everybody has has somewhat the same goal, which is finding uh, planetary systems similar to our own, in which there is a, a rocky planet on which life could develop. I think that's the 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 long term goal for most people. The short term goals vary quite a lot because there are different ways that we can use to detect planets. And so my particular interest is in trying to to see the planets, take uh, pictures of them. Right. And for the moment, this can only be done for giant planets uh, like Jupiter or much larger. Currently, that's where my interest lies. Let's talk more about that. My understanding is one of the ways in which you've contributed to the field quite quite greatly has been developing novel observation and, and ways of treating images. Can you tell us a little bit about that without getting into too much, uh, too much technicality? The problem uh, in trying to see exoplanet is, is, is the large difference in brightness between the planets and the stars. Uh, and we're talking millions to billions of times. I mean, the, the planets are million to billions of times fainter than the star. And on top of that, when you look at them in the sky, they're located very close to each other. So, so you have to see something that's incredibly faint right next to something that's very bright. If you just uh, take a, a standard camera, even at one of the largest telescopes, and you point the star, the planet will be completely lost in the bright glare of the, of the star, and you won't be able to see the planet. Mm, see. Uh, so so we, have, we had to develop observing strategies, instrument, image processing techniques to be able to um, sort of remove the light from the star without removing the light from the planet. And if you succeed in doing that, then you can actually search for these planets. So that's what we've been working on for the past uh, 10 years or so. And we've had some success. We were able to to find some planets at last. Uh, let's talk about one of those uh, major successes, um, that first 
a major discovery in 2008 for which you and your fellow researchers were awarded yep. the research scientists of the year um, by uh, w- which program was that? that yeah, program? it's it's uh, it's a program called Les Années Lumière of the French CBC radio station. Right. Um, yeah. So the title was uh, Scientist of the Year for that uh, very discovery of of three exoplanets orbiting um, a young nearby star. Right. The star HR eight seven nine nine as yep. as. Uh, astronomers or astrophysicists would describe it. So let's talk about this particular discovery. Why was this such a big deal? Uh, It was a big deal because it was the first multiple planet system discovered with imaging. And it was also surprising because of the scale of the system. Uh, So the system has three planets, five to ten times the mass of Jupiter on orbits uh, larger than our solar system. So it was something that was sort of, in, in a way, unexpected. Hmm. It's it's a much larger system than the solar system, uh, and um, it was also the first uh, successful direct imaging discovery of exoplanets. A direct image that you were able to take of the planet itself. Yeah, of the three planets. Let's get into more details about this particular discovery. Tell me first about this star. Um, was it an average star? Was it like our sun or something quite different? Uh, it's different. It's more massive than the sun, about 1.5 times its mass. It's, it's much, much younger than the sun. The age, we believe, is about 30 million years. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, the sun is 4.5 billion years, so it's, it's very much younger. And that's important because uh, if this, the star had been as old as the sun, we wouldn't have been able to see the planets. And the reason is that these giant uh, gas planets, uh, when they form, they, they contract from, from a large molecular cloud of gas. And, and as they contract, they heat up. And they reach temperatures of a few thousand degrees. And, and then right after they form, they, they start to cool off. And, and so with time, they just cool and become fainter and fainter. And so if, if we look at them when they're young, that's when they're brightest and thus uh, easiest to see. And that's the reason why um, the star being so young, we were able to see these young planets who had formed recently and were still hot from their formation. As part of your your ability to detect these planets, is it do you preferentially look for young stars because of this uh, this advantage as you described it? Yes, we do. Uh, at this point, we almost exclusively look at young stars uh, because of that, because the planets are brighter and easier to see. And with the current technology, we wouldn't be able to see uh, giant planets around much older stars. Uh, so to to look at those, we we need to wait a few years for new instruments to be developed. Gotcha. What about the distance from our solar system to this particular uh, planetary system? Um, do you also preferentially look for uh, closer star systems? Uh, again, easier to detect uh, what's what's going on in their neighborhood? Uh, yeah, so we, uh, as much as possible, we try to look at nearby stars because the, the closest a star is to the sun, then the larger the angular separation between the planet and the star will be. Right. And so you'll, your faint object will be uh, further away from the bright object that prevents you from seeing the planet. Uh, so for that particular system, HR 8799, uh, the star is about 130 light years away from the, from the sun. Um, Which is relatively that, close. Yeah, it's relatively close when we think about the, the galaxy or the, the scale of the universe, of course. Right. Um, can you tell me anything else about the planet itself uh, beyond its mass? Uh, are you at the point where you're able to talk about, uh, you know, whether it has an atmosphere, its temperature, things like that, or are we not quite there yet? Uh, yeah, we can estimate the temperatures. Um, the The furthest of the three is about, um, we think, uh, 900 degrees, and the inner two are about um, 1,100 degrees or so. Uh, so these planets are gas giant planets, uh, so they have no surface really like like Jupiter, but they do have an atmosphere, and we think that these atmosphere contain clouds of dust um, uh, and so this is this is not entirely unexpected because we know of some objects uh, called brown dwarf at slightly warmer temperatures who do have uh, dust in their atmospheres. Uh, but it was somewhat of a surprise to to see evidence for dust in these uh, lower temperature objects. Hmm. Uh, but but that we've we've good evidence for it. 
Because of the fact that the detection um, systems sort of are biased in terms of, you know, younger stars, ma more massive planets, that sort of thing, are you able at this point in time to tell me if this was, if these are typical planets, if this is a typical system, or does, does the term typical even mean anything at this point in time? The word typical means something, and I think we can already say that this kind of system is not typical. Um, so we've been looking at um, several stars over the years. Uh, since 2004, um, we've been regularly going to the telescope and, and observing new stars. And so far, we've observed, uh, with the best uh, imaging techniques, about 250 stars. And this is the only one around which we found such a planetary system. Hmm. So, so that's telling us already that this is not a typical system. That's what I wanted to get into, is maybe looking at this particular discovery in the context of the research you were doing. You were involved in this, in this other research project, involving yeah. the, the, a survey of, of uh, 85 or so stars in the Upper Scorpius Association, uh, which is a group of young stars that formed about 5 million years ago. What, what was the goal of that particular survey? Was it similar to the, the research that led you to the, uh, the 2008 discovery? Uh, yeah, it was similar to that, but there were also other aspects. Uh, so by studying stars at such a young age, we uh, also wanted to study how the stars themselves form. Um, because at five million years, they're just newborns, basically. Uh, so you can see uh, characteristics that would uh, provide you some information about the mechanisms by which they form. For example, uh, how many of them are found in, in, in binary systems, in triple systems, and what are the relative configuration of these systems. And so that's one of the, the things that we wanted to study in that study. And the, the, the other one was uh, to find planets, or brown dwarf, but objects with low mass uh, around these stars. At the present time, uh, looking at all the different surveys and research, research that's been done in this area, how many planets have been photographed so far? Probably about a handful. Uh, so there's the HR8799 planetary system that we've discussed. Mm -hmm. uh, in that study of uh, upper Scorpio stars, we found one object which has a mass in the planetary regime uh, in orbit about a uh, sun, which is somewhat similar to the sun, but much younger. Um, there's a group in Europe who also found a planet around Beta Pictoris. So Beta Pictoris is also a, a, a young star, much more massive than the sun. Uh, the planet is also a gas giant, very similar to the planets found in the HRD79 system. And then there's an object called 2 mass 1207b. Uh, that one is, a, is roughly a 5 Jupiter mass object, uh, which we could call a planet, but it doesn't orbit a star. It orbits a uh, brown dwarf, which are so objects uh, intermediate between uh, planets and stars. So they're more massive than the most massive uh, planets, but less massive than the least massive stars. So I think that's, that's pretty much the count of all the image planet. I should mention that there was also um, a, an object discovered around Fama Hot that was also discovered in 2008 using the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, but the nature of this object is, is still under debate, so we don't know exactly uh, if it is a giant planet or if it is uh, something slightly different. So we need further study to, to really understand that object. I see. Um, you said at the beginning of our conversation that one reason that propelled you into this was looking for Earth-type planets. Have any yep. Earth-type planets been photographed, or are we even at the technological stage where we could, where that could be feasible? So no Earth-like planets have been photographed. Uh, a few have been found using indirect techniques uh, in which the planets are not seen directly, but they're uh, deduced from the effect that they have on their stars. The technology is not there yet to take pictures of Earth-like planets, but uh, there are many people working on it, and we believe that we've identified uh, what we need. Um, then it's just a matter of, of uh, making the prototypes and, and, and following the process through completion of a real instrument. That will require a space mission, uh, because you really have to get above the Earth's atmosphere to be able to achieve this. And we're probably talking about 15, 20 years in the future before we can achieve that. Mm. There were a couple of uh, comments, I think, uh, in the media release that you put out about the 2008 discovery that I wanted to uh, ask you to clarify. One 
was suggesting that it takes two years before we can verify that a star and a planet are actually bound together. I guess it's curious to me that it, that it's not obvious that a, that that if a planet is near a star or something planet-like is near a star that they're that they're connected. Um, why does it take why does it take that amount of time to be able to verify that they are in fact bound together? So the first thing is that the the simple fact that two objects are close together in the sky uh, is not proof that they're physically bound to each other. There are so many stars in the sky, and, and these planets that we're uh, imaging are, are very faint. And so a, a bright star located very, very far away could have the same apparent brightness as these faint planets. So just by uh, discovering a faint source next to a star, we don't know whether it's a bound low-mass planet or if it's a, a much more distant uh, bright star. So to... To determine whether it's a planet, we have to take observations over uh, some time, as you said, for say for two years. And so, when we do so, so the the principle behind this is that every single star has it as an independent motion within the galaxy. So it, it's traveling in some direction at some given speed through the galaxy. And if an object is physically bound to the star, it'll be traveling in the galaxy with that same motion. So if you observe the system at one point in time, then you wait a few years and you observe the system again, then the, the planet and the star will have moved by the same amount relative to all other stars that you can see in the sky. And so that's just what we're doing. So we're taking multiple images at different points in time, and we're looking to see whether the two objects move, with the same, move by the same amount over time. And if, if they do then it means that they're physically bound to each other. And if they don't, it means that the other objects that you imaged uh, close to the star is unrelated and traveling independently through space uh, over time. Let's go back for a moment and discuss what's typical in this uh, right now sort of chaotic uh, research field. Um, we're getting lots of data from lots of different places, and I'm wondering if we can start drawing conclusions that might um, shed some light on the formation of our own solar system. Are we unique the way, uh, the way our planet formed? Uh, I think we are beginning to shed some light on many things. First of all, we've discovered close to a thousand planets so far, so we have really a, a large sample to, to draw conclusions. And so we've discovered many things that were unexpected, like I'm just going to mention uh, objects that we call hot Jupiters, uh, which are objects just like our own planet Jupiter, but they orbit their, they orbit their stars at distances smaller than uh, Mercury or Venus orbits uh, the Sun. So they're giant planet, but very, very close to the star. Right. Uh, so that was one of the surprise. But what is beginning to stand out as, as typical, if we can use that word, is that stars frequently have rocky planets on orbits of uh, less than one or two AUs. And that's, that's coming from both uh, studies using radial velocity to detect planet, as well as studies using uh, transits, uh, such as the very successful Kepler mission. I wanted to turn to yet another discovery that uh, I think you were involved in. Um, I'm referring to uh, a University of Toronto-led team of astronomers, and you were looking at extreme brightness changes on nearby brown dwarfs and talking about uh, storms yeah. and stuff like that. That was amazing to me, the idea that we can now look, at least in the case of some of these larger extrasolar planets, at, at atmospheres and potentially storm patterns. How, However do you detect storms and temperature differences on exoplanets? The discovery that we made wasn't on an exoplanet, but it was on a brown dwarf, right. which is an object slightly different. It's, it's just more massive than what we, uh, we call planets. And it's isolated in space. It's not in orbit around the star. But the, the object itself is very much similar to a gas giant like Jupiter. Uh, so the, the phenomena that take place in its atmosphere are similar. And so what we've observed is um, changes in brightness of the object over time. Uh, so we just um, point the telescope to the, to the star or to the brown dwarf, and, and we record uh, images and we measure the brightness of the star as a function of time and we see that it, it slowly gets brighter and then it gets dimmer and then it gets brighter again and, and dimmer again and so it follows this periodic change in brightness which is caused by 
uh, the rotation of the objects, which bring uh, different cloud structures of the object uh, within our view. And as the object rotates, the structure move out of the way on the, uh, the side of the object that, that is hidden from us. And so that creates these modulation in the brightness of the object. Are we getting to the point where uh, beyond just uh, beyond just the s- storms and, and weather patterns and that sort of thing, that we can actually tell the constitution of the atmospheres? And if so, are, are we getting tantalizingly close to being able to tell if there are signatures of life on some of these planets? And how, how would we go about doing that in the future? Yeah, so we are already getting some uh, measurements of the composition of the atmospheres of the planets, both for uh, the planets that we've imaged as well as the planets that were that were found indirectly, uh, and all of that is done using spectroscopy, which is the technique we use to sort of separate the the light into its uh, different colors, and we measure the relative amplitude in the different colors, and the different molecules or atomic species that make up the atmospheres of planets have uh, uh, different effects on lights of different colors. So by analyzing the relative amplitude of light of different colors, which is spectroscopy, we can uh, deduce the molecular or atomic content of the atmosphere. So for example, for the the giant planets around uh, HR 8799, um, well, we know that the atmosphere contains um, dust clouds that I've already mentioned. Uh, We know it contains water vapor and uh, carbon monoxide as well. Hmm. So, and for um, another ca- class of planets, which are uh, the transiting planets, we can also use the technique of spectroscopy to investigate their atmospheres. And for some planets, we've detected some uh, some some atoms, such as uh, sodium, for example, was was discovered uh, in really? the atmosphere of a few uh, of these exoplanets. Wow! In the future, the, uh, we are. Uh, currently developing the the James Webb Space Telescope, and and one of the uh, goal of the James Webb Space Telescope is to be able to do spectroscopy of these transiting planets, uh, especially the Earth-like transiting planets, in the hope to detect um, molecules that would indicate whether the uh, conditions are suitable for life to develop. So that should be achievable with that new facility, which is expected to to start operation uh, by the end of this decade. Wow, that's very, very exciting. Um, you seem to be always busy making discoveries, Dr. Lafreniere. Can you tell us, uh, give us a sneak peek if there's anything on the horizon that uh, will be coming to our attention soon? Much more discoveries from the Kepler mission. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, that should come uh, very soon, I believe. Uh, there are many surprises and many very interesting systems that will come out of that. We are working on um, building uh, a new spectrograph that will be specialized for finding habitable Earth-like planets around low-mass stars. And so by the middle of this decade, 20, uh, 2015, uh, it should start operation, and I'm pretty confident that we'll be able to, to find um, a handful, at least, of these habitable Earth-like planets uh, with this instrument. The future uh, research could uh, allow us to detect satellites around these planets, uh, like the moons around Jupiter. We could detect moons around giant exoplanets. That's also something wow. that, that could very well be done in the, in the next few years. And many other things that we just cannot think of today, uh, because that's how research is done. It, it's always full of surprises. You never know what doors uh, your research will open into other areas yep, of research. Yep, in our exactly. last few minutes, I wanted to just turn to the implications and why why this area of research is so fascinating, uh, much beyond the astro- astronomical community itself. You were named uh, one of the top 10 researchers at the University uh, of Montreal, I think, for this particular the 2008 discovery and, and your related work. Um, within the academic institution, in this case, University of Montreal. Why is exoplanet hunting something that gets that level of attention, do you think? I think it's just appealing to everybody because everybody can relate to, to planets. Uh, we're obviously living on one. Uh, we see our own planets like Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Venus in the sky. And it relates to fundamental questions about our origin and, and, and the universe. 
I mean, how did we, uh, how did our solar system come to be? And does the same happen everywhere in the galaxy? And so I think these questions um, are in the mind of everybody. And, and so the subject of uh, exoplanets is a path to answering these questions. So I think it, that's why it interests most people. Indeed it does. Dr. Lafreniere, I want to thank you again for joining us on the first episode of The Star Spot. You're welcome. The Star Spot's current in space segment highlights important news and developments in astronomy and space. Please send your news and story ideas to starspotpodcast at gmail.com. Considering Canada's size, the Canadian aerospace and space sector punches well above its weight. It is the fifth largest in the world, employing 80,000 strong. On February 27, 2012, the Canadian government announced the launch of an independent review of the aerospace sector. Former Canadian Minister of Industry David Emerson will lead a team consisting of a three-member advisory council. The mandate of the review, which will report back in December of this year, both to the government and to the public, is, quote, to produce concrete, fiscally neutral recommendations on how federal policies and programs can help maximize the competitiveness of Canada's aerospace and space sectors, end quote. With the emergence of the private space industry and space tourism on the horizon, the retiring of NASA's space shuttle program and so many other changes in the space programs of countries around the world, Governments seem to be realizing the necessity of restructuring and shifting priorities to meet new challenges and opportunities, and to forecast future global trends. Assisting the review will be a secretariat directed by government official and Carleton adjunct professor of political science, Scott Strainer. As part of its goal to reach out to industry and other stakeholders, there will be a series of public consultations with submissions accepted until the summer. Starting early, Striner met with about 30 industry insiders at a meeting of the Canadian Space Commerce Association in early March. The discussion revolved around the complex question of how the government can ascertain just where the industry is headed in as far as 30 years in the future, and how best to create an environment for success over that time frame. Many of those commenting reinforced the need to seek input from the so-called new space or private space sector. Striner described his job as a gift, explaining that in a time of economic restraint, this review stands out as an anomaly. The government's desire to prioritize the success of this particular sector suggests an understanding that the space and aerospace industry is not a financial black hole, but rather an important investment in the country's economic future and a central vehicle for job creation. More information on the review is available at aerospacereview.ca, where public submissions may also be made. Thank you for joining us at the Star Spot, mind and universe continually expanding. The Star Spot with Justin Trottier is an astronomy and space themed podcast based out of Toronto, Canada. The Star Spot is produced by Amanda Gadke, branding by Blair Renault, and marketing and technical support from Ying Zhang Li. And I'm your host, Justin Trottier. Please send your comments or questions to starspotpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening.